Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce once again Dr. Aldous Huxley. To my knowledge, no man has ever enjoyed the popularity among Santa Barbara audiences as has Dr. Huxley. Time after time when he's speaking, the auditorium has been full to overflowing. When another person is on the platform with Dr. Huxley, I find the best thing to do is to make the remarks brief and let him take the podium. I do wish, however, to point out tonight that this lecture, as with all the Huxley programs, is a joint effort between the Regents of the University of California and the Santa Barbara Citizens Committee for UCSB. It has proved to be a most worthwhile town and gown venture. Financial contributions from just 90 Santa Barbans have made possible the Huxley lectures and seminars on campus, as well as the community events such as we are going to experience tonight. Dr. Dr. Huxley, for his part, has continued to be most generous of his time and energy. It would be my guess that almost everyone in the audience has either heard Dr. Huxley on the UCSB campus at a community function or via radio and television. It would be repetitious for me to review his career. It has proved to us, he has proved to us without a shadow of doubt that he is one of the great intellects of our times and with a remarkable facility of communication. It is worthy of note that he was the first person to have received an honorary doctorate degree from the University of California, Santa Barbara. I know that you have anticipated this evening as keenly as I. It is my pleasure to present Dr. Aldous Huxley, speaking on the subject, Art, Artist, and Society. Dr. Huxley. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I propose to talk this evening about a subject which has always interested me and which I really don't know exactly what the answers are, but I shall try to expatiate on the questions and on the various tentative ideas which have come to me about this interesting and curious subject of the, of the artist in relation to society. I can't, of course, go into the problem of why art exists at all. It, it obviously is one of the fundamental traits of human beings that they desire to bring order to the chaos of their immediate experience. And one of the ways of bringing order is through art. There are other ways, of course, through theology, through metaphysics, through scientific theories. But art presents another and uh, in many ways more powerful fashion of bringing order to chaos. And uh, this uh, profound desire of the human race for order has always found expression, among other things, in the various forms of art. Now, when we come to the problem of the relation of art and the artist to society, uh, the questions we have to ask are these. Uh, does art, as Shakespeare says, hold up the mirror to nature? Or does art, or does nature, as Wilde has suggested, often hold up the mirror to art? In other words, does society follow the artist as much as it, uh, as it molds him? On the other hand, uh, does art pursue a course parallel, so to speak, to social history? Uh, is the artist representative of his society? Or is he representative only of a very small constituency uh, consisting of other artists uh, temperamentally uh, and by training like himself? Uh, these are questions which uh, I shall try to uh, answer or anyhow discuss in the course uh, of this lecture. And let me begin now with um, describing some experiences I very recently had in New York, two plays which I happened to see there. Uh, one play was uh, a revival of Our Town by Thornton Wilder, and the other 
was the production of a new play by Tennessee Williams called A Sweet Bird of Youth. Now, the question arose in my mind, to what extent and in what way can it be said that these plays are related to our society? Most of you have probably seen or at least read our town. You, you know that it is a, a very charming and um, in many ways profound picture of a small town at the beginning of this century and of the life of uh, the simple and decent people within that community. Uh, on the other hand, probably most of you have neither read nor seen the other play, The Sweet Bird of Youth, which I will briefly describe. Uh, it was the third play of, of Tennessee Williams, which I have seen within the last year or so. In the first two, the, in the first of the two plays the, that I saw the, before The Sweet Bird of Youth, uh, the principal character was eaten by dogs. In the second, he was eaten by cannibal children. And in the present play, he was merely castrated, so that uh, you can say that it had a relatively happy ending, this play. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, um, the story was, uh, was a strange one. It's of uh, this uh, unfortunate young man who acts as a, a gigolo to uh, a more or less insane superannuated movie star and uh, continues to have a, a hopeless passion for a young girl whom in earlier years he has given a venereal disease so that she has to have a, a complete hysterectomy on the account of which her father and brother decide to, to castrate him and this is how it ends. <laughs> Well, it seems pretty obvious on the face of it uh, that uh, this play of Mr. Williams' uh, does not hold up the mirror to our society <laughs> because it's, it's quite clear that any society in whose members or even quite a small minority of whose members carried on as the characters in these plays carry on really couldn't persist for more than a week. <coughs> Uh, in a society such as ours, a highly complex uh, technical society, it's quite clear that there must be an enormous amount of, uh, of cooperation, of goodwill, of self-denial, of uh, organized knowledge, of uh, steadily uh, applied intelligence to keep the society going at all. And it's very interesting to to realize if one has had anything to do with the theater and knows how extremely difficult uh, and arduous the task of producing a play is, it's amusing, as I say, to realize <coughs> that in order to produce a play about the kind of uh, neurotics and psychotics and, and uh, hopeless uh, egocentrics uh, which are described in Mr. Williams's plays, uh, it is necessary to use an Im immense amount precisely of these uh, qualities of cooperation and intelligence and, and steadily exercised will, which uh, the characters of the play themselves deny. Nevertheless, the interesting fact is that audiences evidently very much enjoy going to these plays. They, they go in large numbers, and that uh, insofar as they do this, it is clear that these, uh, this kind of play does uh, reflect something in our society. And exa in exactly the same way, uh, a play like Our Town, which is after all a play which has held the boards for a considerable number of years now, this too uh, holds uh, the admiration and respect for of our society. Now, strangely enough, our town reflects our particular society almost as little as does the other play, because it's quite obvious that the overwhelming majority of us no longer live in anything remotely resembling 
of the little town of 2,000 inhabitants uh, in New England in 1901. Uh, but what uh, I think we can say of both these plays is that uh, what they do is to reflect a kind of ideal, a negative ideal on the one hand and a positive ideal on the other, which many individuals have developed in themselves by reaction to the kind of society in which they live. They, in as much as they pursue the negative ideal, uh, they want to unscrew the lid to take the uh, uh, to get rid of the reasonableness and the goodwill which is necessary to run our kind of society and to, uh, so to speak, let their hair down and to, uh, to indulge in mindlessness and pure egotism and they get a certain relief uh, in seeing this uh, presentation upon the stage. On the other hand, they get equally a relief from seeing a picture of a kind of idyllic, simple life which they no longer are able to lead in our highly complex urban industrial civilization. And uh, they find uh, just as much satisfaction in this positive ideal as they do in the negative ideal of the other plays. Uh, we can quote here... Uh, a phrase of Blake's, which is uh, William Blake, uh, which is a very significant one, where he says, damn braces, bless relaxes. We want both to be braced and to be relaxed. We um, find it extremely bracing and stimulating uh, to watch the spectacle of violence and horror. It does give us a kind of, of psychological kick. And at the same time, we want to get <clears throat> the satisfaction of being relaxed by a spectacle of uh, peace and friendliness and decency, uh, such as it's very difficult for us to achieve now in the highly complex, uh, atomized uh, metro metropolises of, of our modern time. So that you, you have this curious um, uh, spectacle of two uh, diametrically opposed types of art uh, representing something in our present society and making a definite appeal to very large numbers uh, in that society. Uh, so that uh, one sees from the first that it is, ex it is extremely difficult to, to lay down any law about the way in which any given work of art uh, represents a society or stands in relation to it. We, um, uh, we find, <coughs> of course, that um, society is multiple and individuals are multiple. They, we, the artist, in religious terms, speaks to our condition, but the, our condition is numerous. The conditions in any given society, there are a great many people with many different kinds of condition, and even in the same individuals, there are people with different conditions at different moments, so that we can get this, uh, this curious, uh, paradoxical spectacle of the same people getting as much satisfaction out of our town as they do out of a sweet bird of youth. And this, it seems to me, throws a good deal of light upon some of the great sweeping generalizations which historians are only too prone to make. I think, for example, of a, of a generalization which I read not long ago in a, a book by Christopher Dawson, the uh, historian of, uh, the English historian who writes above all of of the Byzantine and early medieval period. I remember his uh, generalization where he speaks about the character of the uh, Byzantine Empire and says that it differed profoundly from uh, our own society inasmuch as people were 
intensely and exclusively preoccupied with uh, uh, theological and metaphysical problems. And he quotes in support of this statement a passage out of St. Gregory Nazianzen where he uh, speaks about the barbers and the shopkeepers and the bath keepers uh, being um, continually arguing points about the Holy Trinity and the proceeding of the Holy Ghost from both persons or from one person. And uh, on this basis, uh, uh, Dawson makes this sweeping generalization about the, the nature of uh, Byzantine society. But he neglects it to point out that the, exactly the same writer, Gregory Nazianzen, in another passage, uh, comments with dismay upon the passion with which uh, his contemporaries in Byzantium uh, occupied themselves with the chariot races. And they were so violently interested in this sport that they used actually to kill one another in the arena when the greens and the blues uh, competed with one another. So that one sees that these magnificent generalizations of the historians are based, I feel, on an extremely flimsy foundation uh, that they, they assume that human beings are much less complicated than in fact they are. And um, even in a relatively simple society, such as the society of Byzantium, uh, we see two quite incompatible, uh, seemingly incompatible things going on together, an interest in chariot tracing and a, a passionate, equally passionate interest uh, in metaphysics and theology. And uh, any art of the um, period, if it reflects only one of these, would not hold up the mirror uh, to nature as a whole. Uh, this is the a point that we, uh, we have to, uh, I think, to stress again and again. Uh, and it's worthwhile, I think, to bring up a number of examples which illustrate uh, this, uh, this whole point of view. Uh, the fact that a literature, for, uh, I'm talking specifically about literature, uh, may represent only quite a small part of the society within which it is written. Uh, I'll give one or two examples of this. For example, let us take the, um, the case of restoration comedy. Uh, this uh, restoration comedy was a very peculiar phenomenon in English literature. It, uh, it had a degree of licentiousness and, uh, and brutality which uh, a comedy really at no other time has had uh, in, uh, in England. And we have assumed in consequence that the whole society of the time of Charles II, during which uh, these comedies by Wycherley and Etheridge and, and Dryden and uh, Shadwell and, uh, and Rochester were written, have assumed that the, the whole society uh, partook of this uh, licentiousness. But then when we examine the historical facts, we find something very surprising. To begin with, we find that uh, during the reign of Charles II, there were only two theatres in London, as opposed to uh, six or seven in the much smaller London of Elizabeth, uh, uh, 70 years before. And that they did so badly financially that the two companies had to combine finally, so that there was only one theatre. This means quite clearly that even in London, quite few people saw these comedies, and virtually none outside London ever saw them. Moreover, we have statistics which give us an indication of uh, the sale of books at this time, and we discover that the uh, sale of the printed versions of the Restoration comedies amounted to less than 2% of all the books published, uh, so that we uh, are forced then to a completely different point of view in regard to the period. The period as a whole is not reflected by the uh, Restoration comedies, which simply reflect uh, an attitude common 
at court and in relatively small circles uh, in the metropolis. Then again, coming nearer to our own time, we have the, the strange and interesting case of the Victorian novel and the, and the Victorian ethos, its, uh, its mores and behavior. Because the Victorian novel is, on the whole, extremely prudish and, and uh, uh, careful not to talk about uh, things which were then regarded as improper, we assume that the whole Victorian era was a prudish era. Well, it's perfectly true that uh, there were in Victorian society a considerable number of people who undoubtedly were extremely prudish. And among these prudish people happened to be two men who, from a literary point of view, were in a very strategic position. Uh, one of these men was called Mr. Mudie, and the other of them was called Mr. Smith. And these two men owned the two largest circulating libraries on which the, uh, almost the whole income of British novelists in the 19th century depended. And both these men were extreme prudes and refused to carry in their libraries any book which they regarded as in any way shocking. And many of the novelists of the period complained very much of this state of things, but they had to conform if they wished to earn a living. And the result was that the, the um, novels of the 19th century do not at all reflect the actual behavior of, uh, of the society of the Victorian age. Uh, we have a, an interesting indication of the gap uh, between the novelist as he presented himself to the public and the novelist as he presented himself in private life in, in conversation. We have an interesting example of this uh, recorded by Emerson when he came to England and uh, had a, a talk with Dickens. Uh, Emerson records a conversation in which uh, he and Dickens discussed the relative chastity of English and American young men. And Emerson asserted that uh, practically all American young men of his period, I don't know if it's still true, were remarkably chaste. And Dickens, on the other hand, uh, insisted that most English young men were not. And he added that if his own son were unduly chaste, he would be disturbed, as thinking it was a sign of ill health. <laughs> and needless to say, nothing of this kind ever got into any of Dickens's novels. And this is a, a strange and a distressing fact to find that uh, it was necessary for the greatest novelist of the period uh, simply to hold back and not tell the truth as he knew it. Well, I myself, naturally, having been brought up on 19th century English novels, assumed uh, that they gave uh, an accurate picture of Victorian society. And I was really only undeceived. In the year 1937, while doing research for an article uh, about, about the centenary of uh, Victoria's accession to the throne, in the course of that research, I read a very interesting book by a French author whose name I cannot at the moment recall, but he was a sort of André Siegfried of the 18, early 1840s, who was a very intelligent uh, uh, French sociologist who had come to England and spent a good many months in the country uh, studying its economy and its, uh, its sociological peculiarities and had written a two-volume book on the subject when he came home. And this book, I must say, it was to me a complete eye-opener, because he gave, with copious statistics, uh, a picture of uh, life in London, which was uh, so profoundly different from anything one had imagined, uh, that uh, one could hardly believe that it was the same place 
which uh, had been described in the Victorian novels. He gave a picture of this dreadful scourge of child prostitution, which was uh, common all over London, with its hideous pictures of these miserable little girls uh, creeping along the streets of, uh, of Covent Garden, and the enormous proportion of, uh, of uh, patients in the venereal disease hospitals under the age of 15. And uh, he then traveled over the various industrial areas of England, and he writes uh, dispassionately, but uh, one can see uh, with a profound sense of shock and horror, saying that there is no place uh, in Europe, which he evidently knew very well, where anything uh, of uh, comparable depravity can be seen, uh, as could be seen in the England of this early Victorian period. And if, um, a great deal of res historical research has been done since that time. And this whole picture which has, has emerged of this extremely brutal and insensitive uh, dissoluteness of the Victorian age, underlying this thin veneer of respectability uh, in its art, uh, has emerged very, very clearly. So that again we see how strangely unrealistic uh, much art uh, is in relation to the society from which it springs. Now let's take another example, another example of a little earlier, the period, the beginning of the 19th century, which we always think of as the, as the age of the Romantic movement. Well, it was the age of the Romantic movement, but what we generally tend to forget was that it was also the age of the Evangelical movement, and that the... Uh, the only reason why we forget this, of course, is that the evangelical movement never had a spokesman of great talent, whereas the romantic movement had three or four major poets as its, uh, as its spokesman. And consequently, we think of the 19th century uh, as an age of people uh, in revolt against uh, Puritanism, uh, people who were definitely anti-clerical in tone, uh, even anti-Christian in many respects. And we forget that enormous numbers of their contemporaries were, in fact, intensely pious and absolutely terrified in, in a pathological way of uh, spontaneity and instinct and uh, full of uh, the most hideous puritanical disapproval of every kind of the most innocent pleasure. So that, again, here we have the art of, of Shelley, of Keats, of Byron. And what does it represent? It represents something, but it certainly does not represent the, the whole society out of which it sprung. And uh, to go back to the previous century, we, we think of the 18th century as the age of reason, and, of course, it is in one respect. The, uh, but we must also remember that the age of Hume is at the same time the age of Wesley and, and William Law. Uh, the age of Voltaire and rationalism is also the age of Cagliostro, the age in which uh, Casanova was able to make a handsome living by ruthlessly exploiting the superstitions of the rich. And even in our age, there are these are very peculiar paradoxes of the same kind. We live, after all, in the age of atomic physics and biochemistry. Uh, but I was struck the other day, when I was standing in front of a well-stocked newsstand, by the fact that there were no less than 13 magazines published every month on astrology. And also that by the fact that innumerable newspapers publish daily columns on astrology. Uh, so that we have this strange paradox that probably there are now in absolute numbers more people interested in astrology than there ever were in the past, in spite of this, of the fact that we live in an age which, uh, uh, on the surface at any rate, appears to have nothing whatever to do with astrology. 
And incidentally, it's an interesting point to, to remember that neither atomic uh, science, nor biochemistry, nor biology makes any showing in contemporary art at all. So that to study contemporary art, one would hardly be aware that any of these uh, movements were going on. So that, as I say, we have to be extremely cautious uh, in our, our views on um, the relationship between the art of a given period and its society. Another very interesting point, which has always uh, greatly intrigued me, is the relationship between religious art during the various epochs of our history and the religious sentiments and uh, theories of the period. Consider the art of the, the painting of the 13th century, for example. This is essentially a static art, uh, an extremely severe, austere, hieratic form of art. And yet if one looks at the uh, history books, one finds that this period uh, was um, particularly notable for extremely violent revivalistic m movements, particularly in Italy. Well, it was literally impossible to infer the existence of such violent corribantic movements uh, from the art of the period. There, there seems to be absolutely no relation between them. And then again we come to another opposite phenomenon, the phenomenon of art during the 17th century. Uh, here, the, 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 this art is distinguished by a, a kind of what Coleridge called nimiety, which means too muchness. Uh, we see uh, saints in ecstasy, in sort of paroxysms of emotion, turning up their eyes, making wild gestures. Uh, the, these uh, things, both in sculpture and in painting, uh, fill every church and gallery in Italy to overflowing. But now, what precisely uh, did this uh, strange kind of Baroque art have to do with the religious theories and the religious practice of the time? Certainly it had very, very little to do with the, uh, the theology of the time. The most uh, striking fact about this is that all the great masters of the spiritual life of the 16th and 17th century, from St. John of the Cross in Spain uh, to Charles de Condron and Ollier in France, all of them are agreed in deprecating emotionality. Uh, they all insist that the, the real life of the religious life of the spirit is not an emotional life. Uh, St. John of the Cross says in so many words that Christian charity is not a feeling, it is an act of will. And they all insist that the highest uh, religious state, uh, the highest state of prayer, is a prayer of quiet. But uh, from the art of the period, you could never conceivably have guessed that this was in fact the, uh, the, the feeling of the and the, uh, the thought of the great theologians of the time. And then when one comes to look into the problem of, uh, of what was the popular religion of the time, uh, there seems to be no evidence that uh, there was any more uh, corribantic and revivalistic religion at that period than there had been at any other. Uh, so that uh, this extraordinary too muchness of the Baroque, this excessive expressiveness, this over-emotionality which we see uh, it manifested in all its works uh, doesn't seem to have any specific relation uh, to the religious thought or even to the religious practice of the period. Well then what does it have relation to? Now here we come I think to an extremely important point uh, which is this, that the that as far as one can see, art develops according to its own inner logic, according to the laws of its own being. 
the inner logic of its own history. Let us consider precisely this, uh, this question of Baroque art, Baroque painting, and the contemporary music, which personally I don't like to call Baroque music because it doesn't seem to me to resemble Baroque art in any way, but it was the, uh, the contemporary music of the time. Let us examine what the history of these two great art forms was in the later 16th and uh, first half of the 17th century. We shall find that uh, as regards to painting and sculpture and the plastic arts in general, the whole movement of art is from an art of more or less static symmetry, such as we get in the high Renaissance, towards an art of increasing asymmetry and increasing dynamism, non-static uh, non art. The, the whole movement is from something which is, which is fixed around a central uh, core to one which is pushed to one side and where the whole effort of the artist is to try to transcend the limitations uh, imposed by his material and his form to get outside the, the frame, so to speak, or to transcend the possibilities of the marble in which he is working. Uh, but when we come to examine the history of music, we find that the whole, his, the whole trend of the art goes in exactly the opposite direction. It starts with an essentially asymmetrical form and moves during the period when the plastic arts were becoming more and more asymmetrical towards pure symmetry. In the, the great polyphonic uh, music of the late 15th and 16th century, we find forms which are essentially asymmetrical. There is no circular motion. There is no sort of starting point to which you will return, no repetitions, no uh, regular imitations such as, there are is in the, such as there are in later music. There is, uh, the music just goes on straight along, a sort of linear motion uh, in flowing in one direction without coming back to any return. This, I suppose, is... Uh, fundamentally due to the fact that the music of the period was all vocal music and was uh, based upon uh, the settings of sacred texts which were in prose and which consequently didn't have any of the metrical shape of poetry. And even where poems were set, the poems were, so to speak, prosified in the music and the, the whole line was also a one unidirectional flow and never a return. Well, by the, in the early years of the 17th century, we begin to see the substitution of symmetrical square and circular forms for the uh, free-flowing unidirectional form of the earlier music. And as I say, precisely at the moment when um, Baroque plastic arts were becoming totally asymmetrical, music was tending more and more uh, towards the symmetrical forms which reached their consummation in Bach. One can see this uh, process very clearly in the life of a, such a single musician as, as Schütz, the great uh, German uh, composer of the first half of the 17th century. Incidentally, his life uh, is particularly interesting as it, it shows how little outward circumstances uh, affect uh, the work of a great artist. Uh, Schütz spent almost all his adult life fleeing from one part of Germany to another to escape from the Thirty Years' War, which was going on and was causing unutterable havoc and destruction all around him. When it got too bad, he would move somewhere else and he finally moved down to Italy to get out of the worst horrors of it. But all this time, his music was steadily developing out of the asymmetrical polyphonic form towards a form which uh, is uh, quite clearly the precursor of the Bach forms, the, the forms which come round 
to a starting point which is square and circular. So that one sees that the, the whole process in both these cases is determined not by what the society outside is doing or thinking, but entirely by the internal history of the art. Uh, it's, I suppose, the motivating force for the changes lies in the fact that uh, artists don't want to go on doing what their predecessors have done supremely well. They want to go start doing something else. And inasmuch as the plastic arts started with symmetry uh, in the high Renaissance, their followers, the mannerists and then the Baroque artists, a desire to get into asymmetry. And insofar as the composers of the 16th century had worked in asymmetrical forms, their successors in the 17th were interested precisely in forms which were essentially symmetrical and circular. So that we see this curious phenomenon of opposite movements taking place at the same period in these two different forms of art. And I think... Uh, this is um, enormously important, I think, the, the, this um, idea that, uh, to a great extent, the uh, developments of art are determined by the history of art and by the internal logic of, of the form which is being pursued. And another thing we must get out of our heads completely is that a given form of art reflects or implies that those who were surrounded by it uh, behaved in a certain way, uh, in the way that we regard characteristic of the period, as characteristic of the period. I was greatly struck by this a few years ago when I visited in Italy a, a Carthusian convent not very far from Siena called Pontignano. Uh, this is a very interesting place. It's a 14th century uh, convent which was uh, modernized, the chapel and the monks' little houses, because the Carthusian monks lived in separate apartments, uh, were modernized in the eight, early 18th century. And uh, the Carthusians are an extremely interesting monastic order. They, they represent the, the only relic in modern Western Christianity of the original Egyptian monasticism of the early centuries of, of our era. Uh, they are much more like the um, desert fathers of St. Anthony's time than they are like the Benedictines, for example. Each monk is essentially a hermit who lives in his own little house and meets only occasionally with his fellows and their rule is exceedingly austere, and um, the, it is, I think, almost the only uh, order which can boast of the fact that it never had any period of decadence. Uh, they, they have a phrase about themselves that the Carthusian order was never reformed because it was never deformed. And um, so that uh, I think there is no doubt at all that the the, the life of the Carthusians in this building during the 18th century when it was remodeled was uh, precisely as it had always been in the past, that the, a great deal of the monks' time in their little houses, each, as I say, had his own small garden, his uh, uh, small kitchen, his oratory. Um, the life went on very much as it had done since the time of St. Bruno in the 11th century, and uh, the preoccupation of the monks was, of course, a great deal of manual labor and of study. Uh, and also there was this extreme preoccupation with death. The offices of the dead were said every day in the, in the oratory. Well, as I say, this building was a 14th century building which had been uh, redecorated in about 1710 or perhaps a little later, 1720 or 30. And it was really most extraordinary to go into these uh, little houses of the monks and to find each of the oratories uh, looking exactly like uh, the boudoir of a provincial Madame de Pompadour. 
with sort of little uh, rococo twiddles all over the walls. And the immediate, uh, our immediate reaction, because we are unfortunately overly historically minded now, was to think that the monks must have been sort of like the rakish French abbeys of the 18th century. But there was no reason whatever to suppose this to be true, that they certainly went on saying the offices of the dead in exactly the same spirit as had been happened in the past, but surrounded by these furious Rococo decorations. And here again, this to me, this brought home to me very, very clearly, this fact that we must not imagine that because its inner logic has made an art develop into a, what seems to us an essentially frivolous form, that the people who lived in the midst of this art were essentially frivolous. Uh, it's, this doesn't happen to be true at all. But, uh, they, they may be uh, of a high degree of seriousness and of austerity, even in the midst of this extraordinary um, frivolity of, um, uh, of the decoration of the time. Now, let us briefly consider, we've t t talked about now what are the relations of art to society, how does society affect art, and we haven't found any clear one-to-one -one relationship between the two. But now let us consider how does uh, the artist affect society. This again is a, is a, is a difficult question. It, we find as a matter of historical fact that um, uh, every society controlled by uh, an authoritarian authority, the, the authoritarian ruler at the top, um, has uh, that these, the, these rulers have attempted to create an art which would consolidate their power and uh, propagandize their ideas. And the question arises, to what extent has this been successful? It's, again, very, very difficult to judge. In regard to the Middle Ages, for example, when most art, well, at least not most art, but a great deal of it was certainly uh, moralistic and idealistic, the most striking fact uh, which uh, st uh, comes to our mind as we read the history of the time is the enormous gap between theory and practice. I don't think at any period in the world's history have ideals been so high uh, and practice so low as, uh, as during those centuries. And uh, again, in our own day, we, we have to inquire to what extent uh, are the attempts by modern dictators to influence uh, whole populations by means of an officially controlled art, to what extent have they been successful? Again, it's very difficult to judge. I, I, don't, I simply don't know what the, uh, the answer to this question is. All one can say is that the effort is constantly made, and it, it doesn't seem, the results don't seem to be in proportion with the energy put into the attempt to, uh, to impose uh, this propaganda through art on people. But where the artist obviously does affect uh, his society is in, so to speak, uh, creating a style, a style of feeling, a style of thinking, a style of sensibility. Uh, the artist helps us, or sometimes hinders us, in the way we feel, in the way we know the outer world. Let, let us begin with the, the mere act of perception. I think it's perfectly clear that, the, uh, that artists have, for example, we just uh, take the last century and a half, it's quite clear that they have enormously heightened and widened our powers of perception. That um, they have made us see, the, I'm talking now of the plastic artists, they've made us see more clearly a number of the, uh, of 
events in nature than we were able to see before. But there's a very amusing anecdote uh, recorded uh, of Constable and his, uh, one of his chief patrons, Sir George Beaumont, who was a, an amateur painter himself and an art critic, who came to see Constable in his uh, studio one day and found him at work on one of these beautiful, fresh landscapes which uh, uh, were his uh, speciality, which he produced with such extraordinary power. And he said to Constable, uh, now, Constable, tell me, uh, where do you place your brown tree? And um, Constable said, I don't place it anywhere. I, uh, I don't have any brown trees. Uh, the reason for this extraordinary question was that uh, Beaumont had been brought up uh, at a period when in virtually every landscape there was a brown tree. There was a, uh, the, the whole convention of late 18th century landscape had a great deal of brownness about it and it was precisely from this brownness uh, that Constable was reacting into something quite novel which uh, in its time, it finally had a very considerable influence on the later Impressionists. Uh, so that uh, it illustrates very clearly this anecdote how we tend to see in terms of the way that our artists see the world. Evidently, men of Sir George Beaumont's type, he was a highly educated man, a man of a great art connoisseur, uh, but he had got into the habit of seeing nature always with a brown tree here and something else brown there, and that he was rather shocked uh, by seeing Constable painting pictures which were brilliantly green with, uh, with white clouds and blue sky of an intense uh, uh, power overhead. And in the same way, it is very extraordinary to read about the early reactions to the French Impressionists that the people who first saw these pictures were outraged by them, uh, saying that they were not like nature at all. Well, of course, what they meant by that, they were not at all like the nature uh, quotes to which they had been accustomed uh, by looking at the pre uh, painters of the earlier generation. These uh, new, brilliantly colored uh, studies in light uh, seemed to them profoundly unnatural, whereas now we perceive them to be far more realistic, much closer to the truth of immediate experience than what had gone before. So that here, there's, unquestionably, there is an enormous uh, amount which the artist can do uh, to help us to become aware uh, of the external world. And the same thing, I think, is, is certainly true uh, of the literary artist. I, I think, uh, taking again, reverting to the world of nature, I think there can be no doubt at all that uh, poets such as Wordsworth and prose writers such as Ruskin uh, did an enormous amount to make uh, large numbers of readers aware of aspects of nature which they'd never been aware of before. And similarly, I would think that the, the great novelists have, without any question, made people much more conscious uh, of human relationships, of their own character, of the characters of the people around them. That they have, uh, after reading the great novelists and the great dramatists, uh, they have been more conscious of the, of the real nature uh, of, the, uh, of the society and of the individuals among whom they lived. Uh, there's a, they have done more, I would say, the great novelists than the, than the great scientific psychologists, although perhaps this is ceasing to be true now when psychologists are, are catching up on the novelists. But the, certainly in the past, the uh, the novelists provided the, uh, the real textbooks of, uh, of human nature and uh, did an immense amount, I think, to enlarge and deepen uh, men's understanding of themselves and other people. 
And in the same way, I, I think the same is true of the lyric poets, that they have helped people to understand emotions within themselves. After all, the, the most ancient uh, of all the religious precepts is know thyself. And this is uh, a task which has been undertaken not merely by philosophers, uh, but above all, I would say, by poets. And that we, we do find, I think, in the, in the greatest lyric poets, uh, insights which make us understand our own motives and our own uh, deepest feelings much better than we understood them before we read the, the poets. So that here, in this way, I think, uh, this rather indirect way, uh, art has a profound effect upon society, that it, um, it's in one, it sets the style uh, of, of uh, our thinking and feeling, and as I say, it also enlarges and deepens our knowledge. Uh, but unfortunately, we have to admit the fact that there, besides good art, there is a, a great deal of bad art in the world. There always has been that the the bad art and the indifferent art has always outnumbered the bad works of art and indifferent works of art have always outnumbered the good works of art. And whether they outnumber them more now than they did in the past, I don't know. Uh, I would think that this may be true owing to the simple fact that we have these extraordinary media of mass communication now, of mass entertainment, uh, and these uh, instruments uh, of mass entertainment are working almost 24 hours a day, and consequently that the demand uh, for art of one kind or another has never been so great in the past as it is today. We consume inconceivable quantities of, uh, of drama, and music at the present time. And I think pretty obviously this is a case where uh, quantity is not completely compatible with quality, that the, the demand actually outruns the supply. The, the number of talented people at any given epoch is limited. And where they are continually called upon uh, to produce material to supply this Moloch, which is uh, of the mass entertainment uh, uh, industries, uh, they just can't do it. Uh, the, and that the, the quality, therefore, falls off as the quantity of the demand increases. And this, I do think, is probably a, a very serious uh, matter in our day, because it means that a, a great many people are having the style of their thinking and feeling created for them by such media, such, uh, such artistic efforts uh, as advertising, which is after all an art of a kind, and uh, such uh, things as uh, soap operas and popular songs. Uh, and it cannot be said that the, the, the style of uh, of feeling and uh, sensibility which these things create is a very high or desirable style, and yet enormous numbers of people are undoubtedly molded precisely by these things. And what the remedy for this state of things is, I don't exactly know. It's quite clear that you can't uh, legislate bad taste out of existence, and I suppose the, the only hope uh, is to encourage what seems to be good and serious art wherever it presents itself and to try to educate as many people as possible uh, to respond uh, to these good forms of art and to mould their lives, to, to adopt as a style of thinking and feeling uh, these better models rather than the worst ones around them. And on this note of modified hope, uh, I think I will end. Thank you.